afternoon and good evening to all the friends, uh, 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 young neurosurgeons, uh, uh, respected teachers, uh, all the delegates and panelists from different parts of the world. And I, Dr. Sachin Chemte, the chair of ACNS YNS, I welcome you on behalf of ACNS YNS for this yet another uh, educational uh, webinar, which we are conducting on a second and fourth uh, Sunday for the education of young neurosurgeons, especially uh, young neurosurgeons from the low and middle income countries. And today we have another uh, yet another session of one such uh, uh, educational piece, wherein we have uh, Professor uh, Giacomo Pevesi from Italy, uh, who's going to talk about the AVMs and uh, our young neurosurgeon uh, committee member, Dr. Dilshod uh, Mamad Aliyev uh, from Uzbekistan, who's going to talk about the final tumors. And for that, as usual, we have our chief patron, Professor Yokokatu, the president of uh, our ACNS Society. Uh, our chairperson for today's uh, 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 webinar is Professor Akido Kondo, who is the professor of neurosurgery, Department of Neurosurgery, uh, Juntendo University, Tokyo, Japan. And for discussion, we have Professor uh, Alexander uh, Wozniak uh, uh, and uh, Professor Fawad Fizad from Afghanistan. And uh, to share with me, to moderate with me, we have uh, Dr. Rolando Rojas, just caught up in the surgery, who will be joining with us shortly. And uh, Dr. Liu Bui Singh uh, uh, with me as a moderator. So before we start the session, I would request Professor Yogo Kato to say a few opening remarks and encouraging uh, uh, message for the young neurosurgeon. Professor Yogo Kato. So, the welcome and the good, good evening in Japan time. So, thank you very much for uh, the support, the SNS, YNS, uh, the committee, the webinar today. So, we are very excited because uh, uh, Professor Pabeshi is uh, uh, one of the experts of the, not only the vascular, but the, especially the vascular the neurosurgeon in the world, I think. Uh, we are very much exciting to listen to your lecture. And also, uh, one another is uh, Dr. Dale Schott from uh, Uzbekistan Tashkent. He is one of my great uh, fellow. He used to be with me. Uh, now, now he a uh, 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 grown up uh, very big, uh, the neurosurgeon now. So, okay, so then we can start. Uh, Sachin? Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, before starting, the chairperson for today, uh, Sensei Kondo, may I request you to say a few words and uh, uh, for the introduction. Okay. So, hi everybody. Uh, I just wanna, uh, uh, no, wanna to 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 like uh, uh, introduce about the, the Dr. Pavishi about the, the, his talk about that. Before that, I just wanna uh, share that the, some kind of information with uh, with you all. And uh, I just want to share that the, my slide here. And can you see everybody? Yes. 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 Okay, thank you. So uh, as you may know that uh, arterial venous malformation is uh, one of the mysterious diseases and one of the most challenging diseases for neurosurgeons. Uh, for example, in microsurgery, its removal requires uh, all the elements of the surgery, including the hemostasis and the dissection and the cutting and the functional assessment of the brain and the vascular assessment. In uh, while that uh, in an uh, endovascular treatment, that the, its embolization requires the careful consideration in determining the, the treatment and strategy and the selecting the procedure. Uh, as you may know that uh, all the people know about that the, the uh, tragedy of that the, this uh, AVM uh, resulting that uh, uh, patient's life. Uh, everybody know about the spectrum much grade and even just the grade one uh, removal, it may have that uh, some like a neurological deficit depending on the grade, including that almost like a 10%. And if you try to remove that within uh, the grade five, it's almost like a difficult to remove everything. So we believe that uh, one of the treatment of that ABM is uh, uh, our like a law to, to survive that the patient. Uh, in a, in a before the, the two, 20, I think the 2016s. And uh, as you may know, all know about the, the Aruba trial 
and uh, you know something about the, the interventional therapy or medical treatments is uh, uh, always like a, a, a controversy about this, this article, but still uh, they insist that the uh, medical management is better than the, the interventional treatment. Is it really true or something? So I, I really think that the, uh, this title is like wonderful for us to if and when and how to treat AVA is a wonderful team for us. So please have a, like, a good time. And uh, I just want to uh, welcome uh, the Professor Giancomo uh, uh, Pavisi. Uh, Professor Pavisi, uh, could yes. you start your lecture? Yes. OK, can you see it? Yes. OK. Thank you very much for the introduction and, uh, and for letting me to talk about a really important topic, which is uh, not that much of how to, who, to treat navy games. This is a long uh, story for everybody to learn how to take out a navy game, but I will address more uh, indication. So the if uh, if we have to treat them or not, and the timing of uh, of this surgery, and uh, some something about uh, the techniques, of course. But uh, let's start with the presentation of where we are. We we are here in Modena. It's a, a, a small middle-aged town uh, of Italy, of northern Italy. Uh, famous for Ferrari and for fine uh, food. We, we are uh, working in uh, two hospitals in Modena and Reggio Emilia with a population based uh, around 1 million and 5,000 uh, people. Um, let's talk about if to treat AVMs. There are two main uh, points to be focused on, which are natural history and treatment risk. Uh, to decide if to treat, uh, you have to know about natural history of brain AVMs and roughly uh, the annual risk for an intracellular hemorrhage in a rupture AVMs. Um, sorry about this. Okay. Okay. It's about one to point to three percent. And the cumulative risk in 20 years after the diagnosis of having an hemorrhage is 30% with the 8% of five-year risk of a seizure. So these figures are a little bit high to leave an AVM intact. And in, 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 uh, actually, the mortality and morbidity of AVM rupture, which is considered to be less uh, uh, harming than aneurysm, uh, hemorrhage, for instance, is not so, uh, it's not a joke. I mean, it's uh, the patients are left with uh, uh, mortality and morbidity in a significant percentage of cases when they rupture and also mortality is not so, uh, so close to zero. So, uh, and if we look at some, uh, some of the Locations, this, some locations are worse than others, like a uh, posterior fossa. Uh, this patient was 25, uh, 21 years old, headache, posterior instability, grade two AVMs with a small hemorrhage. Okay, you can see it. Cortical drainage towards the sigmoid sinus, small hematoma. Surgery, the AVMs disappear, no focal deficit and discharge in, a, in a 10 days of hospital staying. So uh, this is just to know how to approach uh, the hemorrhagic ones. But uh, as you mentioned before, uh, the Aruba study put a very halt uh, in our uh, in our working process because uh, uh, they randomized two uh, arms, one medical, one intervention with interventional arm without difference or neurosurgery, neuroradiology or radiosurgery. But intermediate results made them stop because 
the, the fatality events like stroke and focal deficit were uh, just among uh, the interventional uh, therapy arm. So the, the study was interrupted and it was stated that medical management is superior to interventional management for prevention of stroke and death in patients with unruptured brain AVMs. So what is the future for treatment of unruptured AVMs? There are, of course, some controversy. They didn't address the grade one and two surgical outcome. The follow-up was limited. And let's say it was unconventional, the strategy of uh, interventional art. Uh, but as uh, uh, in the 80s, endovascular radiosurgery put a limit on, uh, on the experience of our surgeons in uh, In, uh, in treating our rupture ADMs. Also, Aruba put a stop, a very high decrease of surgical experience in, in uh, the, the first 2000 years. Uh, so some uh, published, uh, after Aruba published series were uh, conducted because to see if Aruba eligible patients were uh, having had a, a good representation in Aruba study. And uh, this, uh, were, these publications showed that, that uh, grade one and two ADMs were faring better if we uh, treated them rather than uh, for uh, conservative uh, strategies. And uh, when you have to decide if to treat, you have to go uh, with the treatment risk you have to say to the patient which is the risk of your treatment and this is a, a series of more than 500 surgically treated cases in italy we were a very large group of, of surgeons and we see that grade one and two after six months from surgery they have almost all favorable results and of course, the Spetzer Martin grading scale, we all use them. I use it, uh, and it's the only scale I use it, uh, really. But uh, there are several modifications that were uh, applied to the Spetzer Martin because it was not addressing all the cases in a, a particular uh, way. So the Pons uh, grading and uh, the Lawton uh, supplementary grading scale. And they were best predictors, but this was, I think, the, the best uh, supplementary grading that combined the distance uh, from uh, the, the AVMs to the eloquence area of the brain. And uh, this is very important because I think this is a, a, a frequent uh, question that we have uh, approaching our rupture AVMs. This, was uh, this is a grade two ABM, but question mark why? Because it's grade two, but you, you can see lenticular striate arteries. When you deal with these uh, vessels, maybe you have to follow them deep into the white matter and you go around the area of the nidus or, or behind, beyond the, the area of the nidus. So you, you can, uh, harm the patient uh, going uh, to these uh, vessels. And uh, you see it's a small ADM, frontal ADM, but you have to check where it is in the functional brain. So diffusion tensor imaging, DTI, is very important uh, to uh, consider the functional location of the, the nidus. And you see this very, very close to the to the corticospinal tract and this uh, 3D uh, subcortical uh, representation of the brain uh, can give insight of uh, what is going to be the surgery for uh, the brain. So uh, considering a high risk of permanent motor and speech deficit, I think this uh, case is for sport radio surgery. And this is another case, 15 years old, partial epileptic seizure. Uh, and uh, this was a, a Spetzer Martin II, it's a 2.9 uh, centimeter analogous, very compact. It, it invites for surgery because it's very compact. 
And uh, you see, there is a cortical drainage, a main artery going inside the, 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 the AVM. This is looking inviting for surgery. But when you see the DTI, you see that the deeper part of, of the, this nidus is very, very close. It's adjacent to the corticospinal tract. And if you see the three-dimensional uh, reconstruction of the brain in the, in the dark blue, you can see the motor uh, cortex. And you have to split the motor cortex from the sensitive uh, cortex to find the AVM. And you have to manipulate such a uh, eloquent brain. So this is not a, a great tool. I think it's a great tool plus, plus, plus. So uh, that is a high risk of permanent motor deficit. And I think maybe also the radio surgery people will have to think about to treat it or not. 47 years old, headache, hearing impairment, left temporal arm rupture, ADM, spectrum Martin II. This is the case for surgery. This is a relatively non-eloquent area. I think you can have very good results for, from these cases or like this epileptic seizure, right? Temporal occipital, spectral Martin one. Look at this, small AVM, non-eloquent area. This you, you can take it out without problem. Of course, there are some risks, but very, very, very few. And this is another case. It's 37 years old, 36 years old, epileptic seizure, frontal ABM, spectral marking. I would give free. Let's see it. This is at the diagonal analysis, 2010. Very large. Frontal basal AVM. Also, this is very fairly compact here, seems inviting for surgery. Very large, deep venous drainage, risk of hemorrhage. It's considered from the literature to, to be high. Okay. When you see the angiogram, it's not that compact. There are some filling vessels, uh, spare vessels around the hypothalamus. So in this patient, we, we decided for a conservative match. It's 12 year follow up without hemorrhage. And the patients ask to be treated, but I, I, I indicated a conservative management. And I, I think I, I'm right there. Uh, female 21 years old, left hemiparesis, this is a, a very uh, unusual case, right basal ganglia, a spectrum Martin IV, and one left basal ganglia, spectrum Martin III. With a hemorrhage, this is a young lady, come to us with a slight hemiparesis from this hemorrhage. What to do? Nothing. This is too dangerous, of course. And even if you can take it out, there is another one from the other side, unruptured, but still an ABM. So we left intact. Two months follow up, the hemorrhage disappeared. The patient uh, was not hemiparetic no more. She had Two, uh, two birth children with induced partum in the ears. And it's 11 years of follow up without any hemorrhage. And this is a conservative management that I would recommend again. Uh, dealing with, with, with the timing of the surgery, when or treatment, when to treat an AVM. Of course, unruptured, they have to be. Uh, treated by an elective procedure, so there is no question about timing. But for rupture uh, AVMs, are they emergent, urgent, or you can uh, call the case and uh, put it in elective uh, uh, regimen? 
In 2009, I published this work uh, about uh, surgical uh, removal, acute surgical removal of low-grade uh, spectrum marty one 2 bleeding arteriovenous malformation. We studied uh, 27 patients that were uh, operated in the acute stage within six days of bleed. And um, half of them were uh, comatose, uh, half of them were awake. And we had a percentage of 85% with a good uh, recovery or moderate disability. Uh, the outcome was not significantly correlated with anisocoria or, uh, or with uh, the preoperative uh, Glasgow Coma Scale. So uh, in these cases, uh, like this, we operated them immediately. And here, the, it's not life threatening hematoma, but the subdural hematoma in, of the interhemispheric fissure is, uh, is dangerous. So I took it out immediately for this reason. This is a life threatening hematoma, of course, and this is true a life threatening hematoma, so life threatening that the patient was operated only on angio CT. And there was a small AVM here and with a, an, and an aneurysm on, of the middle cerebral artery. They were both addressed from the same uh, corridor. And she had a good, a good response to the treatment. And this is another case, 77 years old, headache, right hemiplegia, aphasia, left temporal AVM, spectrum Martin free, Dutch hematoma, AVM, There's a short, short, I will shorten the video. Just to show that if you do it, uh, urgent surgery of uh, bleeding AVMs, it's not that kind of different of, from dealing with a, an AVM uh, that is not ruptured. I mean, the, the problems are the same and you have the hematoma to evacuate that have made already a good dissection plane on the side of the hematoma. So it's even facilitated somehow uh, the, the intervention. And you have the tools of uh, ICG during surgery to check uh, the flow, and then you take out the, the AMAMs, and this is the end. And this is control. He remained hemiplegic and aphasic, of course. So in conclusion, early surgery for grade one and two is a safe and definitive treatment, achieving both immediate de decompression and patient protection against rebleeding, reducing time hospital staying, and allowing a more rapid rehabilitative course whenever necessary. This were the conclusion of this study. Uh, but of course, you can also operate rupture AVM on late basis, especially when they refer to you from uh, other uh, side of uh, the country. This is a male of 14 years old, uh, headache, speech impairment. He came to us a uh, few weeks from the hemorrhage. This was the hemorrhage. This is the AVM, it's a uh, opercular, temporal opercular AVMs going deep towards the insula. Not very compact. Here, re 3D reconstruction, short video. Just to show you here that when you open, uh, this is the Sylvian fissure, and when you open the, you you cannot see anything because it's a deep seated AVM. It's underneath the, the cortex. And what you see and what you have to deal with at the beginning is the vein. And so it's a very long, a meticulous uh, work along the vein just to uh, the dissect the vein. Because if you dissect all the vein, then you can get an entry uh, uh, along the fissure without harming the vein. If you keep the vein stick to the brain, you will harm it uh, when you will be deeper. So uh, we went for a dissection of, of the vein, careful dissection without seeing any ABMs at the beginning. But the, the vein, the arterialized vein is our 
uh, North Pole Star, let's say that we, you have to follow it to to get the the nidus, which is uh, deep. And here you, we take out the hematoma, which has made here also here a good dissection plane. And then you go around the AVM. Of course, you deal with some bleeding. You stay just very close to the nidus and identify all the vessels. Bipolar coagulation, non-stick, uh, bipolar forceps. And at the end, the AVM is, is even smaller than you think because it, well, it is without blood, it becomes very, very small. Okay, you make an angiography with uh, green endocianine and then you take the AVM out. And this is the controls after surgery. Speech program, no deficit, and he went back home. And how to treat AVM? Of course, there are a lot of, of uh, weapons that we can use uh, apart from surgery. We can use endovascular weapons, we can use radio surgery, and we can use uh, special combined treatments. And what I would recommend is a very careful uh, look at, at the angiograms. Here are uh, the sheets of the angiogram on the wall of the OR. And uh, we have enough luck to have a hybrid operating room uh, since uh, I think three years ago. And uh, there is, a, of course, a angiographic tool uh, and you can use it intraoperatively to check uh, what you're doing in uh, vascular surgery. This is an eight-year-old child hemorrhage 30 days before admission, neurological intact. You can see the pre-op here up and <clears throat> This AVM it seems like a little bit not too much compact. And uh, the first post-operative angiogram with the hybrid operative group is uh, there is a remnant here. And uh, so we went again thinking that the hematoma had split the AVMs somehow here uh, between the efferences uh, of the posterior circulation. And we took it out, we made a second angiogram, and there is still a small remnant. So we go for the third time and we take it out uh, completely. I think uh, remnants are the cause of, uh, of many of the breakthrough syndromes. So in intraoperative uh, angiography is a very valuable tool. And induction in green angiography is also a valuable tool. And we use also a flourishing guided resection sometimes. I can show you an example of this. Uh, this is a occipital AVM. Uh, before going toward the dissection, I, I used uh, ICG to check the, the flow around vessels and to have an idea of, of the, which are the pains, which are the arteries. It's not so clear always. And uh, here is a fluorescence imaging, very beautiful. And then the, the technique is what uh, Yazagi told us a very, very long time ago now, just a single conferential uh, closure of, of the vessels. And you have to be prepared to face hemorrhages. And here you can see we are working with the forehands, which is very, very helpful for fellows because they face uh, what I think is uh, one of the most difficult uh, lesion in the brain to take out. And they can do it uh, directly with, with, with an experienced surgeon on their side. And then you take out the AVM and the final hemostasis. Hemostasis is made during dissection, not uh, just at the end. This is another tool that we use. It's a Doppler ultrasound. And it's very uh, simple, cheap, 
and you can follow the vein before opening the dura. So just to know where the, the vein is, here it is. And when you open the dura, you don't uh, have very much risk to, to cut it uh, inadvertently. And uh, another tool that we use during surgery is brain mapping. Uh, brain mapping, not only motor responses, but also uh, we use it in uh, occipital radium with this uh, flashlight on the eye, just to, to get visual about the potential. This is uh, the LED flash goggles. And these are uh, the stimulation by the red flashlights. And this can be helpful uh, for occipital and rupture ADM, for instance. You see the ADM is just adhesion to the primary uh, occipital visual cortex. And this is the case. You see the large vein, another vein here, artery here coming, artery coming, nidus, ICG, depicting the initial strategy, where, where are the boundaries that you are going to uh, go through and deep, okay? You can use temporary clip to check uh, the flow and to reduce the flow if necessary when you are, have decided that this is an artery, of course. And then the strategy is a circumferential coagulation of the vessels. And then you take it out and at the end you make a ICG. And you see that the vein remains unfilled. And so the problem is over. And then you check it out with the angiogram. You see the big, large vessels coming to where there was the AVM and now there is not anymore. Uh, when you deal with AVMs, you can deal also with aneurysm. Uh, this is a case with he had a subarachnoid hemorrhage for a right MCA aneurysm associated with ADMs. What to do with this association? Here, endovascular therapy becomes very helpful. Endovascular therapist closed, obliterate the uh, aneurysm with coils. And during the embolization, it seems also that the AVM is going towards a spontaneous thrombosis. There's a very marked flow reduction. So we made a DSA two months later, but it was still uh, active, completely active. So then we went for surgery and we, we took it out. 58 years old, posterior instability, and rupture cerebellar AVM. This is an AVM with a, an aneurysm and rupture with a large S, uh, superior cerebellar artery going uh, to feed the nidus. So the strategy was to close the, this aneurysm by endovascular means and to close partially the AVM in order to get a flow reduction by embolization. This is very helpful, it, it can be done safely. And then with surgery, we took it out. But we learned in the past that embolization alone is not always effective. This is a story of a 52 years old man. In 2011, he had an embolization of this large occipital AVM deep with a large venous drainage, embolization, 
And then <clears throat> after some years, he had a, an intraventricular hemorrhage and the AVM was not changed after the last AVM embolization. It was the, the remnant was still unchanged. So we went for a second embolization and treatment by surgery, but the hemorrhage was fairly tragic to give him a, a bad clinical course of the Glasgow Oxygen scale of two. And uh, this is another case where we used uh, uh, the endovascular means, and I tell you why. It's uh, uh, six years old. He went, uh, he arrived in coma, uh, left cerebellar hemorrhage, very, very hypertension of the brain. So we took him in uh, the OR, evacuate the clot, and look for an AVM that was there because we knew that it was, but we hadn't the time to make an angiography. And uh, because it was too swelling, there's the hematoma. We operated, we took out something that was bleeding. I was confident that I had taken it all, but we made the control and the AVM was still there. And so we went to, to uh, embolization this time post-operative embolization and the patient is, has a very good result. Uh, six years old, brainstem AVM. What to do with brainstem AVM? Do we want this is too deep, too, too eloquent area. So th this is where uh, radio surgery is completely recommended. And uh, this is 66 years old. Pain of getting AVM uh, during a neurological workup for instability. Here it is the AVM, hydrocephalus. We went for an EVT with a good result on uh, hydrocephalus signs and symptoms. But then make also Radio surgery. Okay. Then after radio surgery, she had a clinical improvement, but then she had an intraventricular hemorrhage. So we made a ESA. This is still there, not completely uh, obliterated after some years. This is a common destiny of some radiosurgical results. We have to know this. And there's a clinical version of the hydrocephalus so that we decided to put a shunt and there's improvement of neurological. And we will see how the radiosurgery works in the year. Left rupture of thalamic AVM, 47 years old. This is very big and challenging uh, AVM. I don't think it's suited for surgery. It's too dangerous for the motor area. It's suited for radiosurgery. So we went to radiosurgery. And seven months after radiosurgery, she went to our department for headache, memory impairment, right hemiparesis, vision impairment, and worsening. This is what happened. Radionecrosis was coming up. The big cyst. What to do? Medical treatment, uh, it, it means corticosteroid therapy, and she went very, very, very better. And we will see how is going the radiosurgical workup in the years. So just to conclude uh, this, uh, this concept, uh, I will say that uh, uh, if you deal with the rupture, small spectrum marking one and two, they should be surgically treated. This is the best treatment. When they are unruptured, one grade two should be treated, especially in patients that are young, either by surgery or radiosurgery. Grade three, if they are ruptured, they have to be treated with a multimodal approach on a case-based selection, depending on where they are and, and uh, which uh, uh, technique applies better. 
when you deal with unruptured grade three, either a conservative or radiosurgical treatment is preferred. Grade four rupture should be treated with multimodal on a case-based selection. Grade four arm rupture should be conservatively observed and grade five both rupture and rupture should be left alone. Uh, thank you very much uh, and I'm ready if there are comments or conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your wonderful lecture, uh, Professor Pavesi. And this uh, talk is now open to the discussions. Uh, if anybody can uh, apply to the question for the Professor Pavesi. Pavesi. Can can thank you very much, Dr. Pavesi. Okay. Uh, I can see Dr. Chen has a hand raised. Dr. Chen, you want to ask anything? Adam? Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Thanks for your uh, great presentation. Uh, I have some uh, questions. The first question is, uh, uh, the case is a very impressive uh, aneurysm combined with the uh, AVM. And uh, how, uh, I, I remember you, do the, you did uh, the um, embolar uh, embolization and the operation. You do the, uh, both of them in one surgery or individual surgery? Mm. Um, I do make embolize the AVMs if they're big and if they is suitable to embolization because they have big vessels to be easily reached by catheters. And uh, this uh, usually uh, is done two or three days before a, a scheduled surgery. Okay. In a rupture cases, of course. Rupture cases is another setting. I mean, it depends on, on the hematoma, how big it is, uh, and if you have to go for a direct mm -hmm. surgery or not. Uh, if you can wait, maybe you can use the same uh, strategy, but uh, it depends on, on, on the case-based uh, uh, selection. Okay, I see. Thank you. And uh, uh, how do you uh, decide that the patient can wait uh, for uh, observation or do the emergency uh, operation. If the patient came to the ER and uh, we can see the uh, AVM on the CT scan, just on the CT scan, how can we decide uh, uh, the treatment? Thank you. Okay, uh, grade one and two should be operated immediately or in the first 24 hours, I, I would say. Uh, just the time to study them with the angiography and uh, you can operate them uh, immediately. Uh, and I think it's safe and effective. Uh, grade three, uh, it means that you, you have to do it immediately if the hematoma is life threatening. Otherwise, maybe you have to make an embolization first and then uh, see how much you have embolized uh, if you're ready to approach for surgery in, in some days later, some days later, but not too late. I, I think they are, I don't like to live uh, in bed uh, patient with rupture ADMs. Okay, I see. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. So, Dr. Pavish, thank you very much for a nice lecture. Thank you very much, as always. So, the, do you do the uh, staged embolization if the, the nidus is uh, large? Yeah, and not always, but uh, if it is possible, I like it. I like uh, to find uh, already closed vessels. But you have to think that when you make embolization before surgery, you add a procedure risk. Uh, so uh, you have to balance between the, the advantages that embolization gives you. And in relatively small uh, AVMs, it doesn't give you so much advantages. But uh, in larger ones, uh, unfortunately, they can't close the, the small uh, uh, white matter uh, vessels usually. That they are the most difficult for us to, to, to get and the most uh, dangerous ones. But even if they don't close this, 
side of the AVMs. In large AVMs, uh, flow reduction and the compactness of the AVMs with onyx and with the new materials now, it's a, it's a very good sensation to have uh, during surgery. So the, how many days that just interval for one week or three weeks? After hemorrhage? No, no, uh, the staged embolization, the first uh, embolization, second one, then what is the interval? Oh. Uh, Weeks, I, I would say, but usually we, in our uh, experience, we use uh, one embolization and then surgery. I, I don't like to extend too much because uh, uh, every time you make an embolization, there is a risk also of the procedure. It's not uh, very simple. You, you can you can alter the hemodynamics of the AVMs and they can bleed uh, more frequently than uh, without leaving that alone. So I, I don't like to make very much staged embolization. Uh, I don't think it's... Thank you very much, oh, Kondo Sensei. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have just one question that uh, since the Aruba study has a lot of criticism, about the, the, their method. And one of the uh, criticism is like an incomplete treatment by endovascular or radiosurgery caused a lot of like a trouble uh, without any surgery. And I still believe that the you know, concrete treatment of the uh, AVM is still like a surgery or removal. So what's your opinion about the, this criticism? Incomplete. Uh, incomplete, like, inco uh, like incomplete removal, incomplete no, no. embolization, in incomplete radio surgery, they mm -hmm. all <laughs> means the same thing, that the AVMs mm -hmm. is still there and maybe it's more dangerous. Maybe mm -hmm. it's more dangerous. So you have to, when you decide the strategy of treatment, you have to aim a complete treatment. Otherwise, you make worse rather than better. Okay, so I'm along about that, uh, you know, com you know complete, uh, comprehensive treatment for the AVM is still like a surgery. <laughs> do, do you like that? No, I, I think it's, it's not like this. I mean, you have a rate of complete achievement of treatment with the radio surgery. And you have to think that it is a, a viable solution for a lot of AVMs. Uh, especially when surgery is, uh, I showed you two cases of uh, nearly mm -hmm. motor area. I, I think mm -hmm. it is, uh, without radio surgery, it would be a very big problem to operate on them. Uh, it's a dilemma, ethic dilemma to operate on them because they are 15 years old. They have all life. They, they have a 30, 40% uh, of uh, cases they will hemorrhage in their life. So. Uh, you, maybe you have to treat them, but uh, with the surgery, I know, I know that I have a very high risk to give them uh, hemiplegia. So uh, I like to have the right surgery, <laughs> even if 70% uh, is complete and 30% is not complete. And we will see in the future. Okay, thank you very much for your comment. Embolization is almost never complete, even if it's very, <laughs> Very, very, very. I agree with that. We complete, but it's not complete. Okay, thanks about that. So, is there anybody who wanna ask the professor? So, professor, we have uh, our two discussions. That is, uh, okay. Professor mm -hmm. uh, Alexander, uh, who's the president of Ukrainian Society of Neurosurgical Society, and uh, Professor Fawad Bizad, who's the president of Afghanistan Neurosurgical Society. So, let's take comments from them. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Alexander, are you there? Professor? Yeah, yes, I'm here. Can you hear yes. me? Yes, 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 I can hear you, Professor. Is it okay? So, first of all, Professor Pavese, uh, thank you very much for a great lecture, uh, great lecture. Uh, I was very impressed with your uh, OR, with your hybrid OR. It's great, it's a, it's a great achievement of your hospital, of your... Yeah. So, it's, it's really unfortunate I have not such in my, in my, in my hospital. Um, I'd like to summarize something and uh, add something uh, from the point of view of uh, predictability of our treatment. So, right? when, when we uh, discuss three methods, 
uh, radio surgery. Let's let's start from the uh, last one from radio surgery, endovascular uh, surgery. So, in terms of uh, predictability, of course, the radio surgery is uh, least predictable, especially at the uh, late consequences of uh, this treatment. Uh, then I'd put the angiogram because, of course, it's controllable. Uh, it's uh, less radical than surgery, and actually, it's a very effective method. And the last, and it's the first method, the surgery, it's most uh, predictable, though not always you can predict the functional result, result. Because as you started, it's not for you, it's just for our young colleagues, Professor. So it's not for you. <laughs> Another... No, no, no. Uh, it's not also for me. <laughs> <It's the same. laughs> so according to surgery, once you started to operate the AVM, it's, all, AVM, it's almost impossible to stop until you uh, resected it com completely because to perform a partial remover, removal, it's more difficult than to remove it com completely. So uh, that is why, um, so my point of view that uh, I am able to support your option that we must operate on everything, uh, what we can reject safely. Uh, the, another tool we have during surgery is uh, awakened anesthesia. It helps a lot. So it really helps to, pre to prevent uh, uh, the deficit after surgery, after the direct surgery. Uh, and uh, one more, one more thing what I'd like to talk to tell about uh, that, uh, that when we, we when we, the uh, ABM is uh, the pathology, which is very difficult to, standard, to standardize to put to some standards yeah. and this is a and this is a illustration of how we cannot uh, uh, give the uh, very direct recommendation for example when we can recommend for some tumor tumors according to them the location is easier to standardize sorry uh, but for AVMs uh, uh, the more uh, complex AVM uh, from one to five, the more individual approach uh, must be must be chosen for its uh, management. This is that is my comment. Uh, it's like uh, actually it's outflows from your lecture. And thank you again for for your dear, really very nice lecture, very good and very very good cases, uh, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I agree with your comment. Uh, just one question back. Uh, is about the, the awake anesthesia for AVM. Uh, I don't have any experience because uh, I think that AVM surgery is so long that uh, may, may be so long that the awake anesthesia is to uh, enhance for, for the patient to be awake for so, such a long time. Maybe you can check the first uh, steps and then you you make sleep the patients. Maybe in this case it can be useful, but for all the, the, the procedure, I, I wouldn't uh, do it because I, I, I don't like to have the patient awake uh, for such a long time. I, I don't know what is uh, your opinion about it. Yes, I agree with you. We usually we use it uh, at the initial stages of surgery and not uh, in grade three and four AVMs. Usually, it's a small uh, so small AVM of eloquent error. We just check because you know because the locations is uh, sometimes it's, it's uh, functional. It it uh, not always uh, the same as you 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 have have an MRI. So anyway, yeah. we have to check. We have to check uh, physiologically the okay. see, the functional areas, and then we put the patient in the, in uh, the anesthesia and uh, do not wake him. Usually, we do it when we perform tumorous AVMs. Uh, not all the time awake it. Of course, it's, it's very difficult uh, and even dangerous. Of course, but at the, in, at the initial stage of surgeries, and in case of not big, small AVMs, so when they go to, to operate, this is what I wanted to say. Thank you. Sensei, Thank you. Sensei, do you have a do you yes. have a wake surgery for AVM? 
Do you have experience? No, actually, no. I have no experience about that. The, since the ABM is like a, a I, I I totally agree with the, uh, Professor Pavisi because that it takes a long time and occasionally that it's bleeding. So which means that you know we need to control that uh, our operating room first. <laughs> I mean I mean if it, if you feel that the patient feels something bad, I think I don't think it's a good idea to manipulate that IVM surgery. Okay, so thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Pazunigak. And uh, we have another discussant from the Afghanistan, uh, Professor Pizad. Could you give us uh, some comment? Hello, first of all. Hi. Hello, hello, and uh, konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. Uh, professor, yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, CEO. Uh, uh. Hello. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for uh, me to uh, take the chance. And this was excellent lecture and with good and excellent learning purpose and learning uh, message for, especially for young neurosurgeon. It was really good structures. Unfortunately in Afghanistan, we haven't the possibility to uh, operate on EVMs, but we have a lot of uh, things uh, and advice from you. Thank you very much, uh, Grazia. Grazie. Uh, and also uh, a congratulations for your uh, hybrid uh, advanced uh, operating theater. And uh, until now we haven't uh, uh, only, we have only a simple old microscope in our operation theater. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, we have some uh, training program, uh, our young colleagues with you in the future. And yeah. uh, uh, we hope uh, and um, optimist for future. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie a te. Grazie. Thank you very much for a nice comment. And I think it's a good time to move to the next speaker. Is it right, Dr. Sachin? Yes, yes, perfect, sir. Uh, so I would request Dr. Pavesi to be with us. I'm sure definitely there'll be more questions, but we'll move on to the next speaker. And if anybody has any question, we can discuss it at the end. Please be okay. with us. Dr. Dilchad is our young neurosurgeon who is going to uh, talk about the surgery for the pineal region tumors. So uh, I would request uh, Dr. Dilchad to share his screen. Just to introduce Dr. Dilchad, uh, he is an uh, ex-fellow uh, at... Uh, uh, Fujita Health University, uh, along with Professor Yoko Kato, and a member of our uh, uh, Asian Young Neurosurgeon Committee. So he's going to talk about the, uh, his experience about uh, uh, principles of final region tumors uh, surgery at uh, his center. Over to you, Dr. Nishan. Thank you so much, uh, dear teachers, dear mentors, dear Professor Yoko Kato, dear Alexander Wozniak and uh, all other our uh, fellows. And so I'm going to share some of our experience and uh, uh, talk about the very basic principles of pineal region tumor surgery. So uh, this is uh, what I am going to go through. And um, the lesion of this region is all by rare but extremely diverse. Uh, the first report of pineal tumor was uh, by a French physician, Charles uh, Drelinci, uh, stated that treatise, uh, sorry, uh, stated in, in a treatise published in Geneva, he presented the case of young woman with a lesion the size of Paul's egg. Uh, those times, the surgery on this area was terra incognita. In uh, 1904, Harvey Cushing reported that performing one of his famous bitemporal decompressive craniectomies on a patient whom an autopsy later found a quadrigeminal plate tumor. So this is the historical aspects, uh, how the development of the pineal region tumor was uh, firstly by Sir Victor Horsley, he proposed a supratentorial approach, splitting the tentorium from a central posterior position in order to expose the region. But unfortunately, the patient died because of surgical complications. And the next, uh, uh, Professor Ludwig Pusep 
uh, he made a transverse ten transtentorial approach with a splitting of transverse sinus and tentorium with, uh, with survival of the patient up until the third post-operative day. And uh, the first uh, successful surgery was uh, done by the father of German neurosurgery, Fedor Krause. He performed the first uh, successful section of the pineal tumor. In the meantime, uh, Walter Dandy in, in America uh, proposed right occipital transcalosal approach with anterior posterior exposure of the tumor. Uh, and publishing a couple of serious consecutively treated patients. So uh, this is uh, in a picture of uh, Fidel Krause, who performed first uh, successful resection of the tum pineal uh, tumor. It, it, it is interesting that uh, uh, the, in those times, uh, it was a great discussion about whether the supratentorial or infratentorial approach is the best. So, but it uh, still remains relevant up to the present. Uh, so uh, he operated a 10-year-old boy with a four centimeter diameter lesion in a sitting position in a, using the infratentorial supracerebellar approach. Uh, so he took advantage of natural plane between tentorium cerebellum and by position and managed to preserve the venous system which was uh, helped him to survive the patient um, and reported additional three cases with no mortality. And Walter Dandy, which we have uh, uh, spoke before, and another uh, professor Van Wagenen, Wagenen from University of Rochester described an unconventional supratentorial transcortical uh, temporoparietal approach. And which is uh, unusual and uh, through dilated lateral ventricle. So uh, etymolo etymologically, pineal is derived from its conical shape, pinea. It's a Latin word meaning pine cone. So it has also been referred as epiphysis. Uh, atomical physiological exploration of intelligence due to its deep location. Physiologically, uh, it's a gland of neuroendocrine system. Uh, it is the basic uh, gland for uh, uh, which modifies the adenal hypothesis, neurohypothesis, parathyroids, endocrine, pancreas, gonads, uh, and adrenal cortex and medulla. Uh, so the basic function is uh, synthesizing the sleep promoting neurohormone called melatonin which is secreted into bloodstream and CSF where it modulates brainstem uh, circuits, which controls the circ circadian rhythm. So the daily, daily rhythm of melatonin secretion is also controlled by endogenous free running pacemaker located in suprachiasmatic nucleus. This is the, how uh, the circuit is uh, constructed. Uh, the light is inhibits the secretion of the uh, uh, through retinal hypothalamic tract, it goes to suprachiasmatic nucleus, biologic clock, and it goes to the down up to superior cervical ganglion and goes to the pineal gland and depressing the, the level of melatonin. And, and the reverse is happened when the no light in the darkness, the simulation of melatonin is increased. This is the schematic view of the gland. So uh, it has apex, body, and stalk, uh, pituitary, uh, epiphyseal stalk, and habinular commissure, and posterior commissure. Uh, it has also superior lamina and inferior lamina, and also in between pineal recess. Uh, the pineal region or epithalamus occupies the caudal roof of the uh, uh, diencephalon. It is located above the tectal plate uh, in close uh, relationship with the posterior incisural space, supratentorial ventricles, and basal cisterns, and deep venous system, and distal posterior arteries. And directly uh, related with the posterior aspect of third ventricle. Uh, 
it shares the natural anatomic corridor. So the accurate knowledge of the, these relationships remains crucial for performing the surgery. This is the different uh, uh, figures, aspects uh, uh, to, uh, to find out the uh, anatomical basic structures uh, near the pineal gland. So the deep venous system, you can see the vein of gallon and the tributaries uh, coming from the uh, basal uh, vein and vein of uh, uh, deep cerebral veins. You can see the uh, tentorium and uh, relationships with the tentorium. So uh, this is posterior view of the gland. You can see the, uh, this is basically uh, cerebellum is removed and you can see transverse sinus, uh, PCA and SCA, which are uh, located more laterally and the venous system is located more medially near to the pineal gland. Uh, so uh, exploration of this area basically uh, puts a risk into the damage of the deep, deep venous system. So uh, the knowing the anatomy of the venous system is very important. So uh, the course of the PCA and its uh, branch to the um, posterior temporal artery and uh, the branch coming from the uh, P2, P3 segment of PCA uh, middle posterior choroidal artery is very important to know because they are uh, going through this uh, pineal uh, recess and supplying the uh, this this area and also uh, venous relationships uh, are very important to uh, to recognize during the uh, intraoperative microsurgical anatomy, the spleen, uh, splenium and vein of gallon, and internal cerebral vein, which is, uh, which is uh, one of the tributaries uh, forming the vein of gallon, and the basal vein. This is the, another uh, anterior past, uh, superior view from uh, to the uh, ventricular system. You can see a uh, superior choroidal vein and thalamus stri striate vein, which are, uh, and middle post uh, posterior choroidal uh, artery, which are uh, along with the uh, internal cerebral vein located in, in between two layers of telechoroidea. Uh, which are in, in the space of vellum interpositum. This is the uh, sagittal plane, which showing us the uh, internal cerebral vein and how it's formed by anterior septal vein and uh, thalamus triad vein. And then it's going to be uh, under the splenium, forming the vein of gallon, where the uh, uh, the gland itself is located. So uh, when we are talking about surgical approach to the pineal region, uh, we have to know that the, basically it is uh, two, two uh, basic uh, approaches we have. It's a occipital transtentorial approach, which is supratentorial and an infratentorial suprasarabular approach and various uh, uh, modifications like midline, off midline, paramedian, lateral and far lateral approach through infratentorial space. So this is the basic uh, patient position uh, for the occipital transtentorial approach. So uh, during occipital transtentorial approach, we, uh, it, it is uh, important to save the veins uh, because the uh, occipital lobe 
is uh, relatively uh, less uh, with the Venus uh, tributaries uh, located. Uh, so you can see that in the parietal area, there is many traver traverse uh, located uh, veins, which is uh, difficult to retract from the falx cerebri. But in the occipital lobe, it is a more easy. It's, it's easy, much easier to retract uh, the occipital lobe. So it helps us to go through the interhemispheric fissure. And uh, exploring this area, you can see that um, uh, first you will reach the splenium and the vein of Gallen and its tributaries. And of course, the uh, arterial supply of the uh, right occipital area. This is a, a nice illustration from the neurosurgical atlas. You can uh, appreciate the uh, retraction of the uh, occipital lobe and uh, straight sinus and uh, encapsulated uh, uh, pineal uh, tumor and vein of gallon and its tributaries are just uh, hugging the tumor. This is endoscopic view. It is uh, uh, very helpful using endoscope, uh, endoscopic imaging during the operation, which shows us the small perforators and uh, tiny branch of the uh, venous system. You can see the inferior colliculus and uh, cranial nerve, uh, trochlear nerve, superior cerebellar artery, uh, superior medullary velum, and the second approach is an inf infratentorial suprasarabellar approach. Uh, this illustration shows us the classical route to the uh, so, so infratentorial space using a uh, slight retraction of the uh, Coleman of cerebelli and opening the arachnoid uh, behind the uh, middle venous system. Here is the uh, superior view uh, how you approach the midline and if you approach uh, if you use the midline approach you can you should uh, go through the bridging veins which are directly uh, training into the sinus and uh, but you have uh, but you also have advantage of uh, direct visualiz visualization of uh, vein of gallon uh, and the paramedian uh, road, you have you can see the uh, lateral aspect of the uh, galen and its uh, tributaries, and lateral and far lateral. It has also its uh, advantage and disadvantages. Okay, then uh, this is posterior view, uh, how it's uh, approached. Uh, you should. Uh, uh, you you had to sacrifice one of the bridging veins during the uh, infratentorial uh, suprasarvella approach. So this these are the bridging veins. Uh, uh, if you come from the uh, midline, uh, you will uh, in most cases you will come across with these uh, types of uh, bridging veins. Uh, it is permissible uh, to sacrifice one or two of the bridging veins, but uh, uh, some authors recommend uh, going more laterally and trying to preserve these uh, veins. So um, and this is our uh, case of a 46 year old lady with uh, uh, admitted us with headache, uh, no focal neurological deficits, no Burnout syndrome, uh, but ophthalmoscopy uh, showed us the papilledema, 
at the second stage. Uh, we thought uh, this is a uh, pineal region uh, tumor, uh, and we discussed this case uh, and uh, decided to go uh, through occipital transcentorial approach. And this is uh, our post-operative uh, CT. It shows us uh, uh, most of the tumor is uh, removed, uh, practically about more than 90-95% of the tumor. Uh, and intraoperatively, we saw that it was uh, mostly from the uh, uh, meningeal uh, tumor. It was the meningioma of this uh, tentorial edge and uh, growing uh, deep into the uh, pineal region and compressing the brainstem and uh, vein of gallon. Successfully, uh, we could remove it uh, through occipital transcentorial approach. And this is the MRI after the uh, fifth day of, of the operation. It, is, uh, it has also slight edema of the uh, soft tissues, and uh, but the patient is doing well. And this is our uh, intraoperative video. So the dural incision is made. So just uh, going uh, interhemispherically, uh, we found that the tumor is just extending uh, and uh, and uh, bending the corpus, uh, the splenium of corpus callosum. Uh, we found the capsule of the tumor uh, macroscopically, it's a meningioma and uh, piecemeal removal and uh, using the uh, microsurgical technique, as always, uh, first devascularizing and then dressing and debulking the tumor. Uh, but uh, in the middle of the uh, our resection, uh, we inadvert inadvertently uh, uh, injured the inferior sagittal sinus, but we then uh, ligated it later on after uh, controlling the hem uh, hemorrhage. We um, just uh, uh, resected it uh, almost uh, totally and opening the, all the cisterns of the uh, pineal region. Uh, we set the uh, vein of uh, gallon and its tributaries successfully. No brain edema. Uh, thank God we uh, did it uh, good. and. Uh, after operation, uh, after uh, seven days, or patient discharged uh, uneventful. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, so a uh, great talk about the, the and the nice summarize about the pineal tumor, and uh, we understand the history of the pineal tumor, and uh, you succeed successfully removed that. Uh, you know, huge tumor. It's it's wonderful, and uh, also uh, uh, it's uh, the selection of the, the surgical approach is like one of the key to access to the pineal region, and uh, you uh, uh, good good and appropriate approach and uh, achieve that uh, good uh, surgical results. So, is there any anybody who wanna say or advise to the to the doctor? Uh, is there anybody? Uh, you can. Uh, you can talk. 
Anything we're is waiting, fine. We're waiting for questions or do some okay. uh, discussion. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, okay. I have some remarks. So first of all, uh, Dr. Mamad Ali, thank you very much for very good, very good lecture, uh, very good work with material. Uh, I would like to say, to, to uh, look at, the, at this problem a little bit wider, to extend it a little bit. So when we say, when we speak about uh, surgery of uh, pineal region tumors, we must speak about uh, different approaches and different positions. So we can operate patients in positions, in sitting position or in lying position. In sitting, also semi-sitting positions is uh, also, I use sometimes semi-sitting is good. Also good for surgery, uh, supratentorial, for supratentorial approach. From lying, sometimes I use concord position, sometimes I use the prone position. It depends on so um, the uh, it's uh, very important is the prefer um, preferences of the neurosurgeons because some uh, of them like to do surgery in the patient's sitting position. For me, I do not do it. I I, I do not use it at all. So um, when we, we consider approach to this region, of course, we when I consider approach. I think I start from the supratentorial as more preferable for me because I like it most of all. It's easy, it's co convenient for the for neurosurgeon, but not always could be used due to uh, the syntopy with the uh, vein of Galen and its uh, contributors. So, and, and what I want, and I want to point out that the position of the veins the syntopy of the veins and tumor are the most uh, important factor that uh, predispose to the approach choice for the tumor. So if I cannot, if the position of the tumor doesn't let me perform the supertentorial, I consider the subtentorial uh, supracerebral approach. I do. What I want to say, I do not use midline approach. I had a terrible complication due to sacrificing of uh, bridging veins. And since that time, I never use midline. From paramedian to lateral, I had a big sector of, uh, for surgery. And I used only from this uh, sector, uh, always preserving the bridging veins, especially, especially medial veins. Uh, very good trick to extend, uh, to extend uh, uh, the field the dissection of the vein, bridging vein from the surface of cerebellum. It's easy, it's not difficult. So if you, even the young neurosurgeon who had experience uh, from lab, it's very easy to dissect arachnoid around the vein and to, get, and to prevent the rupture of the vein during surgery. It's a very good trick, it, it helps very much. Also, I put uh, the um, uh, surgery cell, around the veins, uh, I think, to, to a little bit enforce them to prevent the rupture during surgery. Uh, uh, very often, I perform the tentoriotomy. It's not dangerous for these patients. Just move uh, one and one point, one, from one, one to 1.5 centimeter from the midline, you can do the tentoriotomy. Uh, I, either you go from above or from uh, below, it doesn't matter. Just if you need it, just cut. It's not. It's not difficult. It's not dangerous at all. It's absolutely not dangerous procedure. Uh, what else? Um, mm -hmm. I want to warn uh, you about sacrificing the small veins because the small veins uh, coming to the vein of Galen could be thalamic vein. Sometimes it's, it's would be, it could be very small, and once you uh, cut it. Uh, patient will have a, a venous infarction, uh, very serious, very serious. So, even so, so we must pres preserve all the vein coming to the galente. Anyway, and no coagulation, no, no, no cutting. So actually, this is uh, what what may stops us and uh, make may uh, decrease uh, the radicalism of a surgery. So it's when we cannot dissect 
vein from the tumor surface. It's better to leave the part, part of tumor on the vein than to sacrifice it. And the last one, sometimes I use uh, transventricular, uh, transventricular, uh, uh, trans, transventricular approach. Uh, uh, then I dissect the um, uh, internal, internal uh, cerebral vein with the with the tela, with the tela, and go to the posterior part of the third ventricle. It's a very good approach, but. Uh, the trick of this, uh, we must remember, because we, in, in my head, it's what I, what I had in my first surgeries, because I, I expected to enter the third ventricle as one, at once as I dissected the way. No, usually you have to go at least one centimeter. So we have, we have to dissect uh, the tela from, tel from telamus, uh, because your, your, um, uh, your, um, uh, your trajectory is, ob is oblique. You go to the posterior part of the third ventricle. So don't stop. Go on, dissect and dissect, dissect until you enter the third ventricle. So it's a trick of uh, uh, this uh, transventricular approach. And uh, uh, you you want to? All. Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you so much uh, for your um, subcoroidal, transventricular subcoroidal. I'm sorry, I, I forgot. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. So, so you want to point out that uh, you, you we we have to trace the in, internal cerebral vein and which is uh, leading us to the galen and going yeah. through this vein. Yeah. No, no, no. I just uh, dissect uh, the uh, vein from the surface of the thalamus. Mm -hmm. And go on, dissect the telechorida from the surface, enter the third ventricle, and then uh, I found the tumor. But um, mm -hmm. this approach could be used only in very, very selected cases. In very selected cases. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're uh, welcome. Just I have one question. If the uh, tumor is very hard tumor, like mature teratoma, uh, do you consider in selecting approach about the angle between the pineal gland tumor and occipital cerebral angle? Because sometimes you get blind spot if you go to supra cerebral cerebral approach and you may not able to see the as a panoramic view. While the occipital approach, you can see the panoramic view uh, in certain cases. What do you think about that? The the question is probably for Professor Wazak. Yeah. So to me, it's, it's to yeah. me, uh, if I clearly understand that uh, you you says about the blind uh, blind spots during surgery, of course, uh, that is a reason of uh, approach choice to have note these spots during surgery. So, and if of course is tumor hard, what to do? I cut it by, by step by step, uh, piece by piece, uh, with a sharp. Uh, uh, way, and that's all. Uh, and the one more question is about uh, mixed germ cell tumor. Uh, I have a case with a 12 years old uh, who was diagnosed with the pineal gland uh, germinoma on biopsy with the AFP highs, had ETV and uh, chemotherapy, then attempt of uh, removal of pineal gland tumor, which only partial excision possible because of the uh, very hard tumor adherence of vein, and then had proton therapy. Now the vestibular tumor is there around two centimeters size in the pineal gland. Asymptomatic ETV is functioning well. So would you go for another attempt to remove mature teratoma? Is the mixed germ cell tumor? AFP is normal now. Biopsy first time germinoma. Excision biopsy showing mature teratoma. What would you do? Will you approach again uh, with a different approach to remove tumor or not? Uh, first of all, I I'd like to separate the germinoma from the all the other tumors. So in case of germinoma, I wouldn't operate now. I never will operate. It's a mixed germ so, cell tumor, mixed germ cell tumor. The mixed cell tumor, mm, I'm not sure. And I, now I residual is that? I, I'd observe, I, I'd observe, I'd observe this tumor. Uh, maybe in case in case of enlargement, I, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd think about surgery. Uh, in in this of, case? Progression, in case of progression, but not, not preventive, no prevent, preventive surgery. In, in this case, Japanese neurosurgeon, they routinely operate post radiotherapy, while the rest of the world, they operate pre radiotherapy. Why is it so in the approach of germ cell tumor surgery timing? Mm, 
I, I'm, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I cannot comment this. Any this Japanese student this can answer why the Japanese has default protocol that mixed germ cell resident tumor should be operated post chemo, post proton or radiotherapy, not in between. While the US and Europe they operate the pineal gland tumor before going radiotherapy. Why, why is it so different? Um, I can explain. Uh, maybe I can explain in why because the, Japan has more cases and they are most experienced uh, neurosurgeon in this in the area of pineal tumor. So I trust to Japanese experience in this, okay. in, in this case. <laughs> That's one of the ideas. So I, I just give you that as one comment that, uh, you know, uh, even the mixed germinoma or germ cell tumor, I think the, uh, you know, first priority to give the patient is like a chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And after that, you could choose, if you could see that there's some residual tumor, I think it's better to do that the salvage surgery. And even if it's hard or it's it's difficult to do that, I think that it's one of the good idea to patient to is like remove at all. But uh, if you have some like difficulties, and uh, I think you should change that uh, approaches, even just a, uh, a little bit like invasive invasive approaches, you could do that, and you have to do this, I think. And uh, I, and uh, you know this this is exactly the germ cell tumor. So germ cell tumor is like a, a not like a simple tumor, and I think that you have to go back to the pathology first. And also, or you can discuss with with the, the pediatrician, uh, especially about the, the oncologist, and then you can discuss uh, about the, what's the what's the role of the surgery. I believe so. So it's it's a little bit like a different team. So, but I, I just uh, I have a lot of experience about the germ cell tumor, and uh, uh, I feel that the, you, in your cases, it's the service surgery is better to hit to the patient. This is my comment. I have no idea about that, but still, yeah, I, this is one of the, my comment about that. So you prefer surgery should be done to remove residual tumor post radiotherapy? Am I right? Yes, you are right. And then, do you, do you suggest uh, that any particular Japanese center who has more experience of Japanese neurosurgeon dealing the pineal gland tumor post radiotherapy? Do you suggest many for me, please? Uh, actually, that uh, you know, I I'm not sure that there was like that's the route to the pineal lesion. But uh, uh, we have uh, tons of cases and uh, we have tons of like uh, approaches. And I think, you know, uh, I have, I'm happy to give that uh, some like uh, uh, images and I can give you that some advice about that. So this is not like a common question. It is like a, a personal question. So <laughs> I, I just give me, I, I just give, I just, uh, I just, you can give me that uh, some mail and I'm happy to answer that. Uh, the reason why I'm asking, because I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm the interventional cardiologist and this is for my son uh, who is 12 years old. And I'm stuck at present. Uh, post proton therapy, the residual tumor is there. And now what to do? So I'm struggling to take him to which part of the world uh, with a mixed stem cell tumor, post proton therapy, residual to two to three centimeter size. So uh, uh, it is just uh, if your guidance will be really helpful for me, which center or which neurosurgeon I should take uh, for the surgery and whether surgery should be done or not. Maybe that's rubbish. Uh, Still, okay. yeah. <laughs> please, please go ahead. Right. Sensor, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. First of all, that uh, we are not sure the exact cases about that, and uh, I I think that uh, you feel some difficulty to treat him. So I just I just uh, want to see that the exact image for that, and then and uh, uh, basically that the uh, salvage surgery is better idea. Just a, just a one one comment. So, <laughs> uh, how to contact your sure. email address, please? How to contact your email address? Okay, yes, okay. Yes, we, we, will send, we will send you. Uh -huh. yes, I'm happy to that. send you. Oh, thank okay. you. Thank Dr. you. Kushal Pujara, I'll, I'll share with you the uh, email of uh, uh, Sensei Kondo and uh, <laughs> Professor Pavesi, <laughs> and you can share the images and oh, thank discuss you. with them. I'm sure they will be happy to give that feedback to you. I, thank I, you I, very I, much for participating. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so Dr. Pavesh, yeah. please. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Mamadev, for the presentation. I would ask to ask uh, one thing. One comment is that uh, for, for the approach, uh, maybe uh, also familiarity of the surgeon is uh, an important issue. Uh, I think that for tumors like those meningiomas that you showed, uh, 
a cut-off decision between uh, uh, infratentorial or supratentorial uh, approach is uh, the location of the majority of the, of the volume is if it is under the, the line of, of the tentorial or up above. Um, and I saw it in a, in a picture that you showed that it, there is, you were using the lumbar uh, drainage. Do you use it? Uh, do you put lumbar drainage for trans, trans uh, intermispheric approach in this area uh, routinely? Uh, lumbar drainage uh, we use when it is uh, when there is no uh, sylvian aqueduct compression. I mean, uh, when there is no significant hydrocephalus, or when we uh, when we are sure about there is no obstruction on the CSF pathway, then we, we use it. Uh, but not very routine, not very routinely. Okay. Because I find it useful for occipital interhemispheric approach, because when you yes. open the dura, even if there are small tumors, the occipital lobe tends to, to become uh, not swollen, but uh, big, uh, tense. So if you uh, you don't have a, a, a drainage of the ventric of the, the fissures uh, directly, yes. so if you put a lumbar drainage, I think it's a safe maneuver. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. Little shot, thank, thank you very much for a nice presentation. And do you? Uh, think about endoscopic resection because uh, we do not need such a the positioning of the patient. Mm. Yes, endoscopic uh, procedures are being uh, for the past uh, years are just developing in our country, in our center particularly, and uh, we are trying to uh, learn these procedures for the cranial uh, tumor surgeries. Uh, mostly, what we do. Uh, is now it's a uh, ETV and small uh, intraventricular or uh, intracerebral uh, cystic lesions. We use endoscopy, but for the tumors, well, we have uh, only for transnasal, trans uh, uh, endonasal endoscopic surgeries. But for the cranial, uh, transcranial cases, we have no so much experience. But we are going to develop this uh, direction also. Yes. Maybe Dr. Habib, so you're yeah, the fellow under the Dr. Takeuchi Sensei. So, do you have some experience of the endoscopic reduction or tumor of the possible or pineal lesion? Habib? Probably. Yes. Uh, I, uh, hello. Uh, I'm Dr. Habibullah Hassano from Uzbekistan. Uh, no, I'm training as a fellow in endoscopic surgery at Nagoya University Hospital. So actually, uh, there are uh, so many cases of endoscopic cranial surgery, including uh, cylindric biopsy or tumor removal of different uh, uh, deep-seated brain tumors or interventricular tumors, and uh, as well as transaqueducts approach to the uh, tumor of the fourth ventricle, uh, usually performed by endoscopic surgery. So I'm uh, learning now, I hope I will make a, some contribution to the development of this field in my country in the future. How, how, how you can have an advantage with the endoscopic resection? Sorry? An advantage. Advantages of the endoscopy. Hi. There is some minimally invasive approach, so there is no brain retraction enough, and uh, we can achieve in a deep-seated uh, uh, brain tumors, especially with uh, uh, and the guidance of navigation systems. So I think uh, advantages of uh, endoscopic cranial surgery in some selected cases is high, more than uh, conventional microsurgical uh, microscopic approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and for example, uh, in latest case, for example, uh, we have had a uh, uh, giant adenoma case, which was invaded cavernous sinus and uh, suprasillar growth. Uh, yesterday, we uh, performed a uh, combined endoscopic, endonasal, and exoscopic uh, pteranal subfrontal approach. So, uh, 
Dr. Takuichi uh, performed a transcranial approach, while uh, Dr. Nagatani performed an endonasal uh, approach. And uh, Dr. Takuichi helped uh, Dr. Nagatani by pushing uh, the tumors by uh, transcranial road so that it can be easy to remove by endonasal roots. So uh, there was fascinating and uh, I have been very satisfied. Combined approach. Yes. Okay, great comment. Thank you. So Thank you. I think it's uh, time to ask you that uh, nice comment from that, uh, Professor Howard Pizat. Could you give us uh, some comment? I think that I'm afraid that you are muted. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, please. Thank you. Salam. Rahmat. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the uh, uh, best presentation, uh, Dr. Dushat Mohamed Aliyub. Uh, we are neighbors and uh, uh, Tabrikari. Uh, Ahmad Kalon. You are for your achievements. And uh, it was good presentation and uh, good uh, case presentations and good, good achievement. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, thank you, comments. So is there anybody who want to say something <laughs> to the to the young neurosurgeon? Yes, Dr. Yes. Uh, yes, I want to say something about the pineal tumor. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, uh, as I know, only pure uh, germinal, uh, germinal uh, tumor is sensitive to radiotherapy. Uh, so uh, my opinion is try hard and try best in operation uh, to do the total sec resection. And after uh, pathology diagnosis, we can know very complicated uh, pathology. Uh, so different uh, uh, pathology uh, types uh, uh, indicated a different uh, uh, treatment. I think uh, radio and chemotherapy can help uh, a part of um, uh, tumor patient. Uh, uh, I, remember, I remember some very uh, malignant uh, uh, tumor is very severe, such as yolk. Uh, anyway, uh, so summarize, uh, summarizing in, in operation, just to do the total resection uh, is uh, very important uh, to patient. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think it just uh, it was attempt, attempted once, and then because of it was heart tumor, supracerebellar, uh, venous addition, aerobolism during procedure, they could not take it out. So is it worth it to have second attempt post radiotherapy? Uh, because post radiotherapy surgery is more difficult with the fibrosis and everything. Uh, so I think not everyone can operate uh, like post radiotherapy. So I was reading literature myself and I only found Japanese neurosurgeon, they only mm. operate post radiotherapy, not anyone else in the world. So that's why I thought I asked the question because you are already here. Thank you, really appreciate you. But I don't know uh, that a second attempt should be done or not. Uh, okay. Yes, I understand the, the tumor. Sometimes the tumor is not easy to uh, total resection or subtotal resection. Just to try everything in operation. Uh, and uh, you, you have to uh, uh, make sure if there is a CSF uh, metastasis. Um, and so it, uh, we can decide a different uh, uh, treatment uh, strategy. <laughs> That's my sort of idea. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was localized tumor, mixed stem cell tumor, not metastasized. Uh, now condition is residual post uh, chemo post biopsy shows mature teratoma, asymptomatic patient with mild diplopia. Are you just to do the a biopsy, not a uh, open uh, cranial? cranial no, no, first time was biopsy, which was showing the germinoma, germinoma. Uh, before chemotherapy. Post chemotherapy, they sold tumor three centimeter size. So they attempt surgical removal, open supracerebral approach. They only able to remove one centimeter, which showed the mature teratoma. And then he had proton therapy for two months. So now post proton therapy, MRI three months shows still residual teratoma, uh, which is two centimeter size. Uh, with the uh, uh, ETV is, is working, no other symptom except mild diplopia is there. So now big question is whether to reattempt again or just waiting for growing tetra syndrome again and see whether it's only increase in size, then only you have to operate. That is a big dilemma. I'm not able to get the answer from the anyone. 
Oh, okay. Uh, Dr. Kushal, I, I have found you on Facebook and I've shared the email address okay. of uh, okay, yes. Professor Kondo and Professor Pavesi yes. and our president, Professor Yoko Kato. So please kindly uh, share Thanks. the images and the details uh, with them. I'm Thanks. sure they will be Thanks. happy Thanks. to help you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Discuss later in your email. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so Dr. Sachin, I think it's good time to, to close the, the this session. And uh, I, I'm really appreciate the good comment from the, uh, Professor uh, Bosniak and uh, uh, Professor uh, Pizet. And uh, also, uh, we enjoyed that uh, your presentation, uh, Dr. Dishros. And also, uh, we have uh, uh, we our like uh, acknowledgement about that the uh, AVM is like uh, uh, increased by that uh, uh, Professor Pavesi. So thank you all about that. So uh, please uh, please take care of, of that uh, in, a, in a personal question <laughs> by me. But it's okay to to ask me about that because uh, that we have a lot of cases about the genome too. So uh, I think we have a great time uh, with you guys and. Uh, 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 could you uh, could you give us some information about the uh, ACNS and YNS from the uh, Dr. Sachin? Please yes. go ahead, please. Uh, yes, before we close, uh, Professor Pawad Pizad had requested uh, to talk for a few minutes about the uh, about the recent earthquake in Afghanistan. Professor Pawad, do you want to talk now? You'll have to unmute yourself. We're not audible. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, please. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yes, we can see your screen, uh, Professor. Yes. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we had an uh, earthquake last week in Afghanistan and uh, uh, I like to draw your attention about uh, uh, this disaster in Afghanistan. And as you know, in uh, past decades, the number of natural and man made disasters has climbed, uh, uh, increased, unfortunately, in Afghanistan. And you know, due to, uh, to, to uh, ongoing war, and also we have a lot of natural disaster as well, flood and uh, earthquakes. And uh, you know, the last week we have uh, earthquake, powerful 5.9 uh, reactor uh, magnitude, and at least thousand, more than thousand uh, our uh, people killed, and more than 1,500 people injured. It was in the two provinces of Afghanistan and the Khos and Paktia. And uh, it was in the district of this uh, provinces. And uh, as you see, that's the uh, homes and the houses are made of soil and uh, with wood and uh, not so strong for uh, resistance to earthquake. And uh, also we have a lot of our uh, people displaced. And this is the southern Afghanistan, uh, Khos and Paktia and the, this, uh, the districts, this uh, earthquake happened. And this uh, Afghan men uh, try to uh, find the victims and uh, also to uh, help with the people. And we uh, this is timetable for Afghanistan. Uh, that's the deadly earthquakes. We have a lot of earthquakes in last uh, decades. And uh, 
fortunately uh, and our teams uh, doctors from uh, Kabul and minister of, of health as her excellency minister of health and this dr farid rashad rashid cocker our neurosurgeon was in the, uh, went to the scene and uh, uh, in Khus, we have neurosurgery centers uh, as well. We have university in uh, Khus, but in Paktio, uh, we newly established a neurosurgery center in uh, uh, Paktio uh, with the uh, help of uh, young neurosurgeon, Dr. Zabi Nuri, and uh, also uh, private uh, hospitals and private uh, organization also uh, uh, send teams and also uh, donate uh, materials and also this uh, Aliaba teams, our hospital team went to uh, Paktia and Khos. And uh, fortunately, uh, but thanks we received uh, Asian, uh, Asian Congress of Neurosurgical Centers official estate on earthquakes in Afghanistan. And uh, thank you. Uh, for uh, you, Professor Kato, and board member of ACNS, uh, Arigato Gozaimasa. Uh, reciprocally, uh, Minister of Health and Minister of Education, and our uh, colleagues in Afghanistan Surgical Society, uh, said thanks for you and for your proposal of help. We are looking for your help and uh, uh, donation as well. And also we have a message of sympathy from Afghanistan Neurosurgical uh, Society for the victim of uh, this earthquakes. Before we have the uh, charity and disaster management in our uh, Afghanistan Neurosurgical Society, we newly established the, uh, this uh, charity and also uh, disaster management team. And uh, you see that uh, more than 80% cases were mild. 15% uh, cases was moderate and only 5% cases was severe uh, during uh, inside the injured patients. And uh, uh, which patients uh, are treated in the local hospitals and uh, severe patients, uh, transported to tertiary hospitals in Kabul. And in conclusion, uh, we need emergency health kits and surgical health kits. Uh, unfortunately, due to uh, waterborne disease, uh, our people need drinking water. And we, we are thinking about uh, purifier or uh, filters for drinking water. Also, uh, destroyed homes and our people needs also foods and shelter. As I told, that's our, uh, our uh, people in the rural area, uh, houses are not so strong and damaged by soil and uh, woods, and they are not resistant for the earthquakes. And uh, until they rebuild, reconstruct their homes, they need shelter and tents. As well, we need also training of disaster management for health workers, doctors, nurses, and community health workers, and also teachers and students. Uh, for the disaster management, uh, for the disaster impacts, I uh, take this uh, Shema scheme from uh, Malaysian uh, colleagues that the preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. For this reason, uh, we ask our young colleagues and young doctors, uh, nurses, before, during, and after earthquakes, uh, before they purchasing earthquake emergency kit, and during uh, the earthquakes drop, cover and hold on and drop on the roof, uh, cover with a table or something hard and hold on until the shaking uh, of earthquakes uh, stops. 
and uh, be uh, do uh, prepare to move with until the shaking stop. And uh, what do after it quick check for injured and damaged. Make sure you are trained in car seats. It's very important and communicate and start recovery process. Uh, we like so to also have work with uh, ACNS disaster the, the management team for training. And we have also training with uh, uh, WHO and ICRC as well. And we like to make a team. And also, as you know, Professor Ali Aziz Sultan, he also discussed uh, about the harbor uh, emergency uh, team that we uh, collab uh, collaborate with each other to make a, a training for, for disaster management for health workers, doctors, community health workers, uh, nurses, teachers, and students, and to train everyone in the, when the disasters happen, what they do and what they uh, act. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimasa. Shukriya. Rahmatik. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sawat. Uh, I'm sure you've gone through a lot of uh, 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 political war you had and then COVID and then this uh, earthquake. But I pray to God that uh, gives you a strength to uh, overcome all these things. We are with you uh, uh, in this uh, uh, situation. I would request Professor Yokokato to say a few words. Uh, much, yes. yeah, we are so sorry about uh, the big earthquake in Afghanistan recently. So, but I think uh, uh, even in the uh, Ukraine, uh, the, always we are the, uh, the besides you, so along with you. So just let us know, oh, and, and uh, we do our best for uh, your, uh, for you and your society. But sometimes it's uh, quite difficult to send anything. To, we cannot. Uh, the reach in your country and the, uh, the your hands, I think. That is a big problem, I think. But anyway, uh, the, today the, we had a very nice lectures, especially the expert of the publish. And also the little uh, uh, shot that gave us a very nice uh, lecture as a young, young neurosurgeon. So we hope uh, that your you. uh, future careers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, good cheer. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, ju I just, I Thank just you. want to show that uh, my deepest uh, sympathy and condolence for this fact, and especially uh, Professor uh, uh from the Ukraine. Uh, I have to, uh, I want to tell you that uh, we accept that uh, uh, almost like a uh, twenty uh, medical student in our university now, and uh, they are really working hard, and also that uh, one, one, one couple of the like, students uh, pretty much having at the. Uh, great interest for the, the neurosur neurosurgical things. So I'm happy to teach them, and uh, they are going to back to your country and help you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kondo. And uh, uh, just I want to tell you, because of Professor Kondo belonged to the, uh, the Juntendo University, uh, that is the biggest uh, private university in Japan, and uh, uh, as the highest, uh, the red numbers, the huge uh, hospital. <laughs> so many the cases uh, every day so i think it's a good place to learn and just you can send the, your fellow to his place and the, even the, the nurse i think okay. thank you very much i'm happy to do that so, thank you thank you so much Arigato. thank you so much to professor kondo we'll yes. stay in touch in case of any interest uh, for the fellowships uh, maybe okay. i will contact you later on okay please keep in touch thank you dr sachin Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pawad. We're working on your fellowship. I, I'm talking with Dr. Balamurgan. So uh, uh, right now, I have shifted to another hospital. But Dr. Balamurgan, who is our secretary, general secretary of the ACNS, he has uh, promised that uh, he will uh, try to somehow accommodate for a short-term fellowship of uh, Afghanistan young neurosurgeon who can come there and train for a few months, especially for the vascular neurosurgery. 
So I, I will you update you. I'm working on that and I'll update you on that. Thank you. Okay, and thank along you. with the neuro nurses also, this is one of the very nice center for training of the neuro nurses. So okay. thank you. Uh, Pro Professor Pavesi, you want to say anything before we close? No, no nothing. Just, just say hello to everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I think uh, <clears throat> we will see you in the next uh, event or at the ACNS uh, Congress, as uh, you yes, mentioned, uh, yeah. Professor Yoko Kato. Thank you very much. Yeah, all. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Dr. Sachin, congr Sachin, congratulations for uh, comprehensive neurosurgery publishing books. It, was, uh, yes. it, it seems great. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Yes. So let me share you the last, okay. thank you. last message. Uh, our October. That's a short uh, October uh, uh, 2022, and I would request all your uh, uh, postgraduate students to send their uh, uh, scientific work for and abstract for the uh, presentation. Uh, the deadline is still 31st of uh, June, but we are trying to extend it to July. So please kindly uh, ask your juniors and your PGs to send it. It will be in person and it will be in Shanghai. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next webinar will be on the 10th of July, same time. We conduct this webinar on every second and fourth uh, Sunday. So next webinar will be on the 10th of July. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. For It was a nice and uh, wonderful session today. I uh, really thank everyone. Okay. Thanks so much. The rest thank you, bye -bye. everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.